Gaelic Rinpoche asked me, I, I of course instantaneously said yes. And uh, uh, so uh, it's, and it's wonderful to see such a diverse group of people and friends. Uh, I um, uh, will tonight just really talk from the heart. I'm not going to use slides. I'm going to show one video clip at some point, maybe. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I'll uh, just sort of um, talk a little bit about science and dharma. And, um, uh, and let me begin by uh, just situating uh, the work I do in some autobiographical context. Uh, I had the great privilege of um, being in uh, Cambridge in the 1970s, in the mid-1970s, and, and had the great fortune early on when I was a graduate student of meeting some remarkable people who, whose demeanor and whose presence and whose um, kindness and compassion were infectious. And uh, one of the things I learned about them is that they all had a practice of, of meditation in common. Uh, Dan Goldman was one of them. And there were also a number of spiritual teachers in Cambridge at that time, including Ram Dass. Uh, and uh, um, Ram Dass uh, uh, brought uh, very frequently uh, Trungpa Rinpoche to, uh, to Boston at that time. And uh, those were the folks who are providing my alternative education. Uh, and so I would um, go to classes during the day and get my traditional education. And then these folks were, were giving me an alternative education. And uh, the alternative education was sufficiently compelling to me that uh, I felt that I needed to really investigate more uh, uh, and do it experientially. And so after my second year of graduate school, much, much to the consternation of some of the Harvard faculty, I went to India for the first time. Um, some of them thought I would never come back. Uh, uh, I was pretty sure I would come back. Uh, and um, uh, I went to India and Sri Lanka, and uh, it, at that time got my first taste of meditation practice. Uh, and um, some of you, I'm sure, have heard of Goenka, the, the Vipassana teacher, and he was my first teacher uh, when I went to India. And um, uh, I was also with Dan Goldman for part of that time, and we were spending time with some uh, uh, forest monks in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, and that experience uh, in the mid-1970s convinced me that um, we only really uh, knew a smidgen uh, in Western psychology and, and actually neuroscience really hadn't developed yet at that time. This was in 1974 and 1975. But I came back with a, a really um, fervent aspiration to pursue research in this area. And I actually, with Dan Goldman, the two of us published a few papers in the late 1970s and early 1980s on um, meditation. They're not cited anymore, um, <laughs> for good reason. Uh, um, but uh, it was made very clear to me by the faculty at Harvard, as well as other uh, sort of senior mentors. They, they put their paternalistic uh, hand on my knee. And they said, Richie, if you want a successful career in science, this is not a really very good way to begin. Um, so uh, I took their. Uh, warning to heart. Uh, and, but it was also clear to me that the, cult, the, the times just weren't right for this. Um, the, there was not a lot of receptivity. The measures that we had to investigate the brain were coarse and primitive at that time. And my own experiences as, as a practitioner convinced me that um, uh, we weren't really going to make a lot of progress using these methods. And the last thing I wanted to do was pedestrian research on meditation. So uh, I pursued a career on the brain and emotion, which I still very much continue to this day, and I'm still quite passionately committed to. And the work that we do in meditation is really part of this overall umbrella. Uh, but then things totally changed in 1992. Uh, and uh, they changed dramatically for me. And what happened in 1992 was that was the 
year that I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And um, he invited me and a couple of other people to meet with him in India at his residence because he was interested in encouraging a small team of scientists to launch um, a research project uh, uh, using neuroscientific methods to investigate uh, meditation and to investigate practitioners who've spent years training their mind. Uh, and he knew about me from some mutual friends and thought that um, uh, I uh, was a sufficiently respectable scientist and uh, uh, also knew that I was a closet meditator. Uh, and so uh, uh, that meeting in 1992 was really a very profound meeting. His Holiness really challenged me, and he said, um, you guys use the tools of modern neuroscience to investigate negative qualities of mind, like anxiety and depression and fear. Why can't you use those same tools to investigate kindness and compassion? And um, there really wasn't a good answer, uh, other than that it's hard. But it was hard when we first began with negative emotions. And so I made a commitment to His Holiness on that day in 1992 that I was going to do everything I could to put compassion on the scientific map. And I think if you go back to textbooks of psychology, and certainly to textbooks of neuroscience, um, at that time, uh, none of them actually contained the word compassion in their, in their index, um, which is really nothing short of scandalous. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So I made a commitment to. Um, to him and to myself that I was going to really come out of the closet with my interests in this area, go public, and start actively pursuing research in this area. And it took us a few years to ramp up. Uh, but then we began a project, which we still continue today, uh, which is really uh, um, a very unusual project. We fly to Madison, uh, practitioners, most of whom live in Asia, uh, mostly in India, Bhutan, and Nepal. And uh, these are um, practitioners who've spent a minimum of 10,000 hours in formal practice. Uh, all of them have completed at, at least one three-year retreat. Uh, the average number of hours in our group to date is around 34,000 hours. Um, so these are individuals who have spent a lot of time uh, in formal practice. And uh, our central question was whether this practice, um, the practices in which they're engaged, uh, change their brain in any kind of systematic ways. And we were particularly interested in the early work in focusing on compassion. And um, uh, in that work, uh, which, as I said, is still ongoing, uh, we've published a number of papers from, from this work in, in major scientific journals. Um, uh, and we've discovered that when practitioners are engaged in practices to cultivate compassion, their brain does change in very systematic ways that are measurable. And those changes appear to be associated with some interesting behavioral differences. Uh, and um, uh, that work really was the beginning of what we're calling contemplative neuroscience. Uh, and um, now uh, it's really heartening to see that there are many scientists throughout the world who are starting to work in this area. And it really is uh, having the feel of a field uh, for the first time. And uh, the serious scientific community is really beginning to be receptive to this. I was. Uh, uh, at the center of a major controversy in 2005 that involved inviting the Dalai Lama to speak at the Society for Neuroscience. The Society for Neuroscience is the world's largest and most prestigious organization of neuroscientists. And um, there was actually a front page article uh, in the New York Times uh, about this uh, when uh, uh, this controversy was brewing. And uh, what happened was there was a petition that was um, 
that was formed, uh, and they, at the time the New York Times article was written, was about two weeks before the meeting, and they had about 600 signatories to this petition. The Society for Neuroscience, the membership is somewhere around um, 50,000 people, and uh, about 30,000 attend, a little more than 30,000 attend their annual meetings. These are huge meetings. So there are about 600 people who signed the petition. The first 400 were all Chinese. Um, so uh, uh, there, there was certainly some um, um, political involvement, although it wasn't strictly political. And uh, there are some people who signed the petition, and this is a petition protesting the Dalai Lama speaking at the Society for Neuroscience meeting. There are some people who signed that petition who I consider to be friends of mine. Um, and they were signing the petition because they felt a religious leader shouldn't be speaking in a scientific meeting. Um, uh, and uh, uh, of course, he wasn't coming to speak to the Society for Neuroscience as a religious leader. He was coming as a public intellectual, as a, as a world figure. Um, and uh, it's, it was very gratifying to see that uh, the president and the leadership of the Society for Neuroscience did not back down. Uh, and the meeting uh, went off flawlessly. His Holiness gave a talk to 14,000 neuroscientists who were assembled. Uh, I counted four Nobel laureates in the first row, uh, and all of them stood in a standing ovation uh, for His Holiness after his talk. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, if, if you ask me in the year 2000 whether I ever dreamed that His Holiness the Dalai Lama would be addressing the Society for Neuroscience in my lifetime, uh, it just was unfathomable. And uh, the rapidity with which this kind of change has occurred is really um, very, very striking. When that article appeared in the New York Times about His Holiness the Dalai Lama speaking at the Society for Neuroscience, um, the work that we did, we've done in our lab was actually singled out. And one scientist um, who was interviewed who remained anonymous um, said that Davidson can't possibly be objective because he's actually admitted in public that he himself meditates. <laughs> um, which, of course, I love because that would be like telling a cardiologist who studies the effects of physical exercise on the heart uh, that they can't do any physical exercise for the rest of their life if they want to be an objective scientist studying the effects of physical exercise. Now, the fact is that science is... Um, a practice, uh, and it is a practice which has all kinds of checks and balances within it. Uh, and there are ways that we can set up experiments and have independent replication uh, to enable the process to go forward and at the same time still be a practitioner. I, I find uh, the two actually quite synergistic. Uh, and, uh, and so I loved um, being able to sort of take this on directly when that criticism was uh, actually stated in public. Um, so, uh, but I also should say that it, this is an ongoing struggle, uh, and not all of my lab are meditators. Uh, uh, as I said earlier on, we're very passionately committed to basic research on emotion in the brain, and there are many people in the lab uh, uh, who are not involved in this other kind of work, uh, in the meditation work. And, and the work that they do is, is, is critical. I value it tremendously. And uh, it's been a delicate dance to, um, uh, uh, to have um, the same respect uh, 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 and to, for, to have the same perceived respect for the, the individuals who are not um, part of the, that sangha uh, and uh, uh, those who are. Uh, and in the, before we had our new center, we didn't have a dedicated meditation space. And some of my students asked if they can use a seminar room to sit in. And I've said, sure, it's fine. Um, uh, you know, just sign up and use the room like anyone else uses the room. Uh, but what happened was they would sign up uh, in this room, and if they were using the room, say, between 8 and 9 in the morning, the next group who was going in at 9, if they weren't out precisely at 9 and they stayed till 9.01 or 9.02, the, 
The other group was very reluctant to knock on the door because they knew that there were meditators um, and they felt they may be intruding in some way or that it was a little awkward. And then someone came to me and said, well, what if um, there were a group that came to you and said they wanted to sign out the seminar room for a Bible group? Um, and at that point, I said, well, you know, we really, uh, we really do need a space that's just dedicated to meditation. It's just called that from the get-go. Uh, and that was um, one of the many impetuses for the development of our Center for Investigating Healthy Minds.